The partnership was started here in Los Angeles back in 2008. It was launched by Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, and the focus of the partnership really was how do we improve the lowest performing schools, uh, public schools in Los Angeles. Um, like many big urban cities throughout this country, we really have a crisis here in our public schools in LA, and um, we wanted to go into those schools and really find a way to bring the resources of the city, uh, of the school district, uh, and of the mayor to go about driving change in a very different way for the kids, because we know the kids in our schools, and our schools are in Watts and in Boyle Heights uh, and in South LA, and we've got phenomenal kids, but for a long time, those young people just haven't received a great education. So we have a network of schools with 22 schools uh, serving over 15,000 students in really in schools that the last several decades uh, have been amongst the lowest performing. And when I say amongst the lowest performing, we're talking about schools where you know, over 90% of the students were not at grade level uh, in math and English. And when we started, we had a four-year graduation rate of 36%. Uh, and we've been at these schools now for over four years, um, really focusing on how do we change the culture of the school? How do we make sure the school leadership uh, is as effective as possible? How do we support teachers and make sure that there's quality teaching in every classroom? And how do we really engage uh, parents and community in our schools in a very different way? So would you describe these as, as you know, charter schools or is this more uh, private organizations come in and taking control of, of existing public schools? Yeah, it's a question we get a lot. It's, it's really, it's a nonprofit organization. We are taking existing public schools. My background, actually, I came from the charter sector. I was the president of a group called Green Dot Public Schools. And um, when we launched a partnership, we felt there's got to be a third way, something that isn't just outside the system because although we saw charters as an effective way to support the kids in those schools, just didn't see it impacting the system at the pace we wanted to, but also knowing that a big, large, urban school district like Los Angeles needed help in order to be able to drive change. So if you think about our structure, we're a nonprofit. We have a contract with the school district to directly manage the lowest performing schools in LA. And we um, have freedom from district rules, but we don't have freedom from the state education code or freedom from the labor agreements like charters do. And that was by design because our mission isn't just to lift up the performance in our schools. It's really to help LA Unified figure out how do you lift up all the lowest performing schools at scale and it's something that we think um, is relevant to LA and relevant really to all big urban districts throughout the country. So it's, it's kind of a third way we're thinking about uh, how do you improve your lowest performing schools in a school district. So you bring up an interesting point. We'll, we'll get to the, the kids stuff shortly and the tech stuff shortly. But you know, how do you, if you step into a school and actually lead change among teachers, this is something that people struggle with all over the place. So you bring up the issue of, of leaving the labor agreements intact uh, and, and trying to be really respectful of that. And yet at the same time, obviously, you're, you are trying to lead really substantial change in, in the way these schools are doing business and serving the kids. How do you manage to balance that? Uh, it's definitely a tough balance and it, it's a lot of work, but I think ultimately we find there's a lot of really good teachers at school sites uh, that haven't been supported for a long time, um, that haven't been given the skills and the training they need to be successful, and in many cases who, who haven't been given the opportunity to be, to be successful. We also find that a lot of schools uh, had school leaders in place that, you know, in terms of principals or assistant principals, that maybe just weren't the best fit for the lowest performing schools and principals that weren't instructional leaders. So, you know, we found that before we got there, our principals weren't in classrooms all the time, weren't really focused on lifting up the quality of their teachers. They were focused more on operational issues. So we bring in new school leadership as really step number one for how you change a culture and then embrace a lot of the work that um, the teachers can do and are doing at a school site while obviously bringing uh, new things to play, things like blended learning and others that we know are working other school sites. And, and it's it's tough to do, but we find that a lot of times I think that the union agreements uh, and the teachers get too much of the blame. There's certainly some challenges in the current labor agreements, but there's a lot of challenge in the sector and many that you can address uh, irrespective of the changes to the labor agreements like school leadership, like the quality of the teacher training, like getting parents uh, in, in low poverty, uh, high poverty, low income communities engaged in a very different way, like bringing technology to school sites. Those are things that really aren't, you're not prevented from doing uh, in the labor agreements. And at the same time, we do, as an organization, work with the school district and really through any channel possible 
to drive changes when the agreements are impacting our schools. So an example there is when the budget cuts first hit California, the state ed code and the teachers union agreement says that um, the schools, the teachers that are the lowest on the seniority uh, poll will be fired first. And that was killing our schools because in high poverty schools, you typically have the, low, the uh, least senior teachers actually teaching. So we didn't accept it. We actually called the ACLU. We launched a lawsuit against this rule, both at the state level and in the collective bargaining agreement level. And we actually won the initial lawsuit. And the benefit of our model is that when we win that lawsuit, unlike if you're at a charter school, it doesn't just have impact our schools, it impacts all public schools throughout the state. So we, 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 it is an interesting balance that you mentioned. We first and foremost try to focus on better managing and supporting schools, but we also do when there's issues in the state ed code or the labor agreements that don't make sense uh, for running high quality schools, we certainly first try to work with the state and the labor partners, but other times, in this case, we leverage the legal channel to get some change. That's interesting, uh, that, and that's obviously a, not an easy road to travel. But uh, but you, it's a great point that you know all these uh, you know some, some are, are these really motivated teachers who also have much more recent training in the use of technology and the uh, and the application of modern pedagogy. Uh, you know they they are the first to be out the door, and that's uh, uh, it is a, it's an issue nationwide. So hopefully this has some some trickling down effect. So let's take a minute though and talk about some of the technological initiatives that you've brought to bear. What have you done in terms of blended learning, and and how have you seen the impacts uh, actually on the the student performance? Yeah, so let me let me tell you a little bit of how we got to blended learning. You know, we launched uh, work in our schools in in July of '08, and the first two years. Uh, of our work, we really um, pushed hard on getting the right school leadership in place and giving our teachers more time to collaborate, to work with each other uh, in terms of making sure that the courses the kids were getting were the right ones and also uh, really investing heavily in getting parents and community more involved. And we saw some good gains in our schools, but we just felt like the gains weren't fast enough. If you think about what we're doing is we're trying to take the lowest performing schools and get them at, at a minimum up to the average of the school district and hopefully get them to the higher quartile. And that's just a huge hill to climb. So we really dug deep and said, hey, we've got to find some ways to accelerate success in our school sites. And that's where we really started to see blended learning and technology in particular uh, as an opportunity to be an accelerator for student achievement. And we launched a pilot back in 2009 and 10 um, in a couple of our elementary schools and particularly uh, Ritter Elementary down in Watts and started to see some really interesting and exciting things. You know, we first saw that the kids, when they were working on uh, a computer with quality engaging software that was blending, in this case it was focused on math, you know, bending, blending the base, uh, the best in mathematics instruction with kind of good strong gaming logic and gaming ideas and concepts into the program that the kids were very engaged. Uh, we saw that the teachers, when they were getting more data from using, in this case, the programs called ST Math, when they were getting more data, they were using that data and they were adjusting the way that they were teaching to their students. We saw for some of our teachers who maybe thought, hey, some kids just aren't getting that engaged, when they actually witnessed the young people deeply engaged and excited to learn uh, through blended learning, it got those teachers more excited and more inspired uh, to learn. And so we saw just some exciting things when we were viewing the teachers working with the young people uh, in ST Math. And not surprisingly, when the results came out in terms of state test scores, we just saw some huge, huge bumps. I mean, this is a school that had a 10%, a 10 percentile point uh, gain in mathematics in terms of the students at grade level. And it, it increased the number of students that were not in the lowest band, far below basic or below basic. It went up by 13 percentile points. So these are just massive gains when you think about public education. And, and, and those same fundamental points, you know, more engaging for students, more data for our teachers. When we have a budget crisis and, and you have these huge class sizes, you're able to break the, the groups of kids into smaller groups where some are on the computer and some are direct with the teacher. Um, and you just saw a lot of really, really good benefits in areas that we were having a hard time being successful with without the technology in the classroom. So we quickly moved after that, that pilot and said, let's expand this uh, at a much larger level. And we did a larger pilot in the 2010-11 school year, and by last year, 2011-12, we had over 10,000 students in our network engaged in some form of blended learning in math and in English, uh, and we we're also investing a lot more in using technology 
to give our teachers more tools to collaborate with each other. And we've seen some really strong success whereby, you know, last school year 2011-12, we just got back our state test and we had, uh, without question, the best year we've ever had in terms of student achievement and not surprisingly, the schools that had really embraced uh, blended learning last year were the ones that had the biggest gains. Wow, that's great. I, I think that's uh, you know, something that is a real challenge is, is not just you know, rolling out the applications is easy. It's it's the actual use of the data to drive instruction that uh, is much harder. So what have you done in terms of professional development to provide teachers with the, the tool set they need to use these data? Yeah, so it's a great question. I mean, one of the challenges, people in education, oftentimes you're looking for the silver bullet. And I think as you alluded to, a software program can't be a silver bullet. That can't get there alone. You need to have you know, it's got to be quality software, and there's, there's as you know, because you focus on the space, and there's a difference between just general software and actually quality software. And I say quality software, it's software that's actually aligned to the state standards, uh, that's, that's going to be easily usable both for the students and gets the teachers the information they need, and, and that is consistently evolving and improving so that we're able to give some feedback to the providers and they're able to enhance their products on an ongoing basis. But in addition to that, you've got to make sure you're providing the teachers with the training. Um, and as you heard me say earlier, leadership is essential. So you've got to make sure your principal and your assistant principals are really embracing this because you're not going to be successful with blended learning unless you have an administrative team that uh, believes in it and is going to prioritize their time with their teachers in terms of training time, in terms of allocating their budgets towards blended learning. And then what we really found in terms of success with teachers is they get support and training from their administrators, uh, but they also get support and training from their other teachers. So one thing the partnership is very um, good at and we believe strongly in is we've got to find the teachers at school sites that are really good at things and leverage them to be the ones to help their peers get better. I think this is something that's often missed in education where far too often it's people who you know wear suits like I do and sit far away from a school site that tell a school site what to do or that you kind know, of train teachers for a day and then leave we believe strongly, let's get lead teachers at school sites that um, are embracing blended learning and have them talk to their peers and work with their peers in collaboration with the principals. And that's where we've seen the most success, where we have a quality product, and, and the product's got to be quality because if it's not, the teachers don't embrace it, but quality product with school leadership um, committed to it, and then some lead teachers at the school site who are working with their peers, and this happens uh, once a week we have professional development time for our teachers at all of our schools and then we have also invested some money and raised some private money to pay for teachers to have more time uh, after school and on weekends so they're getting up to speed on using uh, the technology and then and then we've also pushed on our our partners that provide us with the software um, to provide some field personnel uh, so that we've got experts on ST Math, you know or achieve 3000 or revolution prep those are really the key um, software programs that we're using in math and English, as well as Lexi at the, at the elementary school level in English. We push on our partners to have um, folks in the field also working so that when a teacher comes up on a challenge, that there's someone to help them work through it. Because what you don't want to do is roll out a product, roll out a strategy for improving instruction and improving student learning, and then just leave them out there on their own. Um, that's your fastest way to ensure that you're not going to have a successful implementation. Absolutely, I think that's that's just uh, critical, and and you know, so there's a lot of research that suggests that it, it there's there's much more to it than you know providing that that PD. There needs to be that ongoing coaching. Without the ongoing coaching and mentorship, it's not not going to happen. So so how are you finding? Um, in particular, providing these uh, these weekly times for professional development. Is that uh, by shortening a school day, or is that after school? When's that happening? Because a lot of schools really struggle with that time. Yeah, there's, there's two pieces, especially in California right now. I mean, I think we all have to recognize one thing in California, and that's that uh, we're not spending enough money for our public schools. And, and again, you probably know this um, because you're close to it. I'm not sure all your viewers do, but California, we're 47th in the country in terms of the amount of money that we spend per student. And you got look at states like New York and New Jersey that are spending twice as much money per kid on us. So it does make um, both purchasing and implementation of quality technology, both in terms of hardware and software, and it also makes finding the time for teachers to get better at what they're doing difficult. Um, so, so I start with the fact that we need more of it, both in terms of funding, because with funding, you can pay people uh, more to get better, because you can't expect to scale something that requires everyone to volunteer their time. It's just, there's no sector in the country where they, they plan on all their uh, professional development for employees to be volunteer time. 
Um, and it's far too often we expect that in public education of our teachers. Um, what we do do is we're able to organize the school day uh, during the paid teacher time where they get what's called a bank day and, and that's basically about an hour and a half once a week where the students will go home uh, at 1.30 and the last hour and a half is spent for uh, teachers to work together and collaborate with each other. And you're able to do that um, under the, the public school dollar. Now to give you a sense of where we were five years ago, we used to have, I believe, almost 10 days a year for professional development for teachers and that's gotten completely cut. Those were called pupil free days and there's basically none of those left, but we're still able to at least um, put about an hour and a half in during the school week and then we do raise money. So the Partnership for LA Schools, one of our focal points has been how do you, um, we don't raise, we, we try not to raise tons of money that's required forever, but we do try to raise money to kind of launch initiatives um, because you need to, and especially for the lowest performing schools. So we do pay teachers to do additional professional development uh, in the evenings and on weekends and, and also during the summer. Um, for example, uh, and if you came down here in August, you would have seen our summer seminar where we had 150 teachers come out and spend two full days of training uh, on blended learning and we paid them for that and it was invaluable because that, with those 150 teachers, which is about 15% of our network, we got those teachers up to speed and excited and now they're the ones who are out at their school sites both in their own classrooms but also when they're in department chair meetings or when they're in uh, school-wide meetings for development, they're the ones leading their peers and the other teachers uh, towards pushing the work forward on blended uh, that, make, that makes a lot of sense, and you know, it, like like I said, it's, it's the, that piece is pretty critical. You know, if you look though at, uh, and I, I've used uh, both Lexia and ST Math, and they're they're really really strong, but obviously you need to have the, the hardware to support that. So, how have you been able to cost effectively roll out the, the necessary hardware then to support the software? So it's tough. I mean, step one is we're able to make progress on in the infrastructure. So with the kind of E-rate program, which is a national program whereby uh, some of the larger telecoms have to give some funding towards education. That helps pay for the uh, infrastructure upgrades. So that, we're, we've been able the last couple years to leverage the public dollars to pay for at least the, kind of make sure we have enough bandwidth in our school sites. Because remember, we have the oldest, most dilapidated buildings you could imagine in the poorest schools. Um, but we have had to raise money. So we launched a $6.5 million campaign focused around blended learning. We've raised uh, about three and a half of that. We have three million to go. And we've leveraged uh, some of the largest, you know, education foundations, uh, whether that be the Broad Foundation, you know, others like that. We've a number of individuals and corporations uh, from up and down this state, you know, whether it was uh, Coffee Bean, which is a company based out here in LA, or One West Bank, which provided funding for our teachers to get computers. Because if you can believe it, we talk about blended learning and technology in schools, and we have teachers that don't even have laptops. Uh, and that we've changed that situation in the partnership, but we've kind of changed that situation in all of our schools. We expect our teachers to integrate technology and we don't even give them the tools. So, so we've had a number of partners uh, like One West Bank and others like the Weingart Foundation and others that have helped to fund our effort. Um, we, we do think though that uh, our focus and what our campaign is, we fund the first three years. And in LA we did pass a bond uh, called Measure Q. It was a $7 billion bond to pay for facilities and technology and there's about a billion dollars that's allocated for technology. That comes due in 2015. So we think that with that bo those bond dollars, the district will be able to pay for um, significant improvements in, in computers and also the replacement cost for the computers that we've been able to uh, buy with philanthropy over the last, uh, last couple of years. But there's no doubt, I mean, one of the reasons we launched the partnership is we say, hey, the lowest performance schools need more. Uh, and that's got to come ultimately through taxpayer dollars and through the state being more efficient by using those dollars more efficiently. Um, but it's also in the short term got to be corporations and individuals stepping up to make sure that um, we're helping our lowest performing students get what they need in terms of the hardware at schools. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we, we also invest a lot of time working with parents because the beauty of blended learning is kids can go on these programs um, outside of the school day. A lot of our kids don't have computers at home. Um, but we've been able to partner with some groups to bring some more technology into the households and also work with libraries and other local community organizations to ensure that kids at any time, if they don't have it at home, can go somewhere within you know, a mile of their home to get access to a computer and work on the weekends and after school. And that helps a lot also because you know, with the budget cuts, the school year has been shortened a little bit out here in LA and the kids just need more time in math and English, especially ones that are really far behind. And we've seen a lot of young people uh, really embrace these programs and spend a lot of their own personal time 
um, going and, and it's fun to see kids on their weekends practicing math and we can see it because on Monday the teacher comes in and can see what the usage was over the weekend. So that brings my, my final question and this may even be the, the toughest. You know, when you have parents who are in poverty, who are struggling in, in countless ways, uh, how do you engage them? Uh, you know, bring, allowing them to bring uh, resources home, allowing them to uh, access more resources is great, but some of these parents simply, you know, really struggle to find the time, the wherewithal, and, and whatever else to be an active part of this. Uh, what's what's a, a best practice that uh, my viewers can take away? Yeah, well, I think it's something we've done really well. I think I think best practice starts with the foundational belief, and and what we don't just believe, but we know is that every one of our parents love their kid just as much as any parent, and, and wants their kid to be successful. Now, they may not know, as you mentioned, how to best get involved in their in their child's education because maybe they're newer to this country, maybe they're working two jobs in a single family household, maybe they're adults that had bad experiences themselves um, in school and thus are, are disconnected. And these are the kind of um, experiences you see from our parents and what's pretty consistent in high poverty neighborhoods where you just don't have, you have the same amount of love for the kids but maybe not as much of the knowledge on how to actually engage. And so what we do in our schools is we invest heavily in parent engagement and we believe it's, it's responsible uh, that the schools must be responsible to engage parents and, and that they must reach out and embrace parents in a different way. So when we first came into our schools, we got a, a grant from Direct TV and we renovated every parent center in all of our schools. So when parents came to a campus, they had a nice place to go to. Every principal that gets hired in a partnership schools knows that part of their evaluation every year is based on are they engaging parents, not waiting for parents to come to them, are they reaching out to parents so the parents um, are, are welcomed and brought back. We actually launched a parent college in our organization. So once a month, we as an organization provide direct services to our parents where we train parents on things that may be kind of common sense to, an to a college educated family um, or a family that has education in their, um, in their background but that, that isn't as common sense to others. So things like, hey, when you have a parent conference night, uh, here are the questions you should ask your teacher and your school site. Things like, here's what it actually takes for your son or daughter to get into college. Here's what it takes to apply for financial aid. Um, to here's what it takes at home in terms of carving out the necessary space for your son or daughter to, to, to do their homework. And here's a couple of questions, regardless of your education level, that you can ask your son or daughter every single day related to their homework. Hey, what did you learn today? What did you actually read? Things that you can ask to, to make sure that you're constantly um, on top of them. And so that parent college, last year we had over a thousand parents go through our parent college. They're putting their time from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, on the weekends and then we provide makeups during the week for those that can't make it in the weekends. Um, so we're, we're pushing heavily on these strategies and we're seeing this working. You know, we've seen in our network of schools last year over 10,000 um, families, and this is of a network of just a little over 15,000 kids, engaging in an activity related to student achievement at their school site with their son or daughter. And these are numbers that are just unheard of um, for our campuses five years ago. And it's not that we're creating some secret sauce. We're just believing in parents and investing heavily in, in engaging them. And, and the responsibility has to be the school site to reach out. It can't just be a PTA meeting you know, once a month and expect people to come. That's outstanding. I, I think you uh, really hit the nail on the head there. Uh, you, you spend some money and you do the right thing. So I, I really, really appreciate your time today. Uh, this is this is great to hear, and uh, hopefully it's something that can not just be scaled within LA, but within uh, countless both inner city and actually many rural communities as well that uh, what, that face many of the same problems. So thank you again. And and that's the goal. I mean, the goal is we were launched to create a model that really was scalable for school systems and I think if you look at the fundamentals of what we do in terms of the right leadership at the right schools, really embracing teachers and supporting them, launching blended learning in a, in a significant way and engaging parents and, and community in a true genuine way. When you see those things, you see momentum and success and we've got a long way to go and um, we, we've, we've got a lot of work to do but we, we like the progress we've made so far and, and appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to learn more about it. Absolutely. Have a great week, Marshall. Thanks again. Take care. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. We are. We're off. I, I appreciate. It. Thanks for uh, Chris. Thanks for taking the time to reach out and and uh, and.